Hi, I'm Tim Leung, and I'm a stroke survivor, a husband, a dad of two very young children, and I'm very glad to be with you, to share with you what God is doing in my life. Today, we're going to be continuing in the last part of our series, our four A's on acing the trial of pain, how to turn pain into joy. We will experience, all of us, the inevitability of pain, suffering, and brokenness in life. You can't avoid it. It'll happen. What do you do? Can you pick up the pieces and move on? Well, that's what we are finishing up. All right. We talked about acknowledge, acknowledge that God is in control, even over the terrible things that happen. He allowed it, but if he allowed it, he will provide a way out of it. He will provide a way to make it better. He will provide a way to give you beauty for ashes. He will give you blessings instead of curses. He will turn your pain into power. All right. We talked about the second step, admitting, admitting your deep grief and feelings to God, admitting how disappointed you feel, but also admitting that God is your only hope. We talked about last time accepting God's sovereignty. What does that mean? That means to bring to him the broken and shattered pieces of our lives and allow him to do his Kintsugi. Remember we talked about Kintsugi? Ancient Japanese art form that takes broken pieces and puts them back together with greater beauty by not trying to hide the flaws, but enhancing them with gold. Let God restore you to productivity, but with greater beauty as he does his kintsugi on your life. Though created for perfection, we are inevitably crushed by pain in life. If we are committed to God's program of healing, he will cultivate Christ-like character through, through perseverance on the basis of the completed work of Christ's passion. When Jesus hung on the cross, man, he said, it is finished. And so all the power, all the resources, everything you need to allow your life to be turned from brokenness into beauty has been paid for on the cross. Let God do his work of healing in your life. Paul said it this way, my grace, Jesus says, is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. You see, Paul did not hide his brokenness, but in fact, he boasted in his weakness, in his infirmity, in his struggle, because in those areas, he could be a wounded healer and allow the glory of Jesus to shine through. What's last? We align ourselves. What do we align ourselves to? Well, we need to adjust to a different goal, a different purpose in life. We need to adjust ourselves to God's program and procedure. You see, God's goal is Christ-like character. Christ-like character. Holiness, not happiness, right? We've heard that said. Well, God is in the business of taking you and setting you apart for himself. He wants that intimate, personal relationship with you and me where he can reshape us into the image of Jesus. Ephesians 4.15 says, But speaking the truth 
in love. You see, this comes not by just hype, not by just inspirational speaking. No, this comes from speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head that is Christ. You see, Jesus is our model. He is our prototype. Romans 8, 29 says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, we often talk about God as our father, but we fail often to recognize that, well, Jesus is our big brother, all right? He's our big brother. And you know that old phrase, why can't you be more like your big brother? Well, this has truth here, okay? We need to be like Jesus, our big brother. You know, in Cantonese, the big brother is called the Dai Lo, okay? Dai Lo, and it is upon his shoulders that the responsibilities of the family come. It is upon his shoulders that authority comes. And it's slang, Dai Lo, that term Dai Lo is slang for uh, a boss, a leader, um, the big guy. Um, and if you if you were ever in a gang, if you were in a, ever in a, a Chinese gang, you know, you would refer to your leader, your gang leader as the Dai Lo. Okay. And we, we've actually have t-shirts. Okay. That say this, that have this verse and that proclaim uh, proudly, Jesus is my Dai Lo. Okay. Uh, if you would like one, we'd love to get one to you. But, you know, for each and every Christian, we need to look upon Jesus as our firstborn big brother. He is the prototype. He is the original God man. And as we accept God into our lives, right, we too resemble him and follow his lead. We look like Jesus. And you know what? That's what the original word Christians meant. Okay. Uh, it was even a term of mockery. They looked down upon the early believers and they said, oh, well, look, they're little Jesus wannabes. All right. They're like Christians. Okay. Christ juniors, like little wannabes. And um, it reminds me one time, my uh, many years ago, my, my little niece looked at me and I was wearing uh, sandals, you know, cork sandals that's supposed to fit your feet, be very comfortable. And she says, oh, look, Uncle Tim is wearing Jesus shoes, okay? Jesus shoes. Well, uh, my sandals reminded her of the pictures they showed her in Sunday school where, oh, Jesus must have worn sandals that way. They're Jesus shoes. They look like the shoes Jesus wore. Well, we don't want to necessarily look like Jesus or what we think Jesus looked like, you know, grow long hair and a beard and, you know, wear sandals. No, we want to act like Jesus. We want to think like Jesus. We want to react like Jesus. And that's hard. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. Maybe you have got some ways to go as well. We need to change the way we define success. The, the term, oh, you got it. You got it made. Oh, this is the life. Oh, this is, you know, we need to change that. The world would say, oh, we measure our success by the type of car we drive or the house we live in or the possessions we have or our bank account. But, you know, God has a way different way of measuring. He measures a man. He measures a woman differently. One of the ways he does it is by fruit the fruit of a person's life. Jesus said, a good tree can't bear bad fruit and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. What is that fruit? What does it mean to look like Jesus? Well, to be like Jesus, the fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5 says, is love. You see, God is love. First John tells us God is love. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, Forbearance, what's forbearance? Patience, 
Now that's a good definition of patience. Patience is bearing with another person's peculiarities, craziness, madness, okay, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Okay, how do we do this? The verse goes on. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You see, naturally speaking, we want to put ourselves first. Every little baby wants its own way. And we see this. We see this more and more that people of this world are rude. They're narcissistic. They're entirely self-absorbed. And they will take advantage of other people. They will do unscrupulous things. Um, and this is normative. But God wants us to live counter culturally. Okay? Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. But instead, keep in step with the Spirit of God. All right? We've got to change our basic agenda. Not me first, right? We had a catchphrase growing up, I got mine, okay? I don't care about you. I don't, I can't help you. Uh, but I got mine. That's all I'm concerned about, all right? I got mine. God wants us to live the opposite way. He wants us to put Christ first. Not I got mine, but I want to make sure God's agenda is followed in my life. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. How is it possible? Am I a doormat? Am I a pushover? No. The Christian, the power of the Christian, the security of the Christian, the strength of a Christian that allows a Christian to give to others and to serve others and to pursue God's kingdom above his own is what? The assurance that God will take care of him. You see, Jesus says in that very sermon, look around you people. Look at the birds. Don't you see how God feeds every bird you see? God feeds the birds of the air. He takes care of them. They don't go to work. They don't have Roth IRAs. They don't have, you know, investment accounts. They don't worry about the future. They don't create storage barns and gather their crops. They don't punch a clock. But God feeds the birds. He says, look at the grass of the field. Look at the wildflowers. Now, don't look like California, okay? We're, we're in a time of drought. I mean, don't look at the dry yellow and brown grass. No, take a look after a rain. Next time it rains, take a drive into the country, man. Take a look at the carpets of beautiful, multicolored wildflowers. Well, Jesus told the people at the time, look at the flowers. Not even Solomon with all his power and glory and wealth clothed himself like one of these. And he says, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is so worthless that Tomorrow, you gather it up and burn it. How much more is he going to take care of you? How much more valuable are you to God than birds and weeds? Huh? Much, much, infinitely more. And so God will take care of you. He says, in effect, make it your business to take care of my business. I'll make it my business to take care of you. That's what a good father does. Trust God to be your father today. Lastly, God is the potter. Yes, 
We need to accept his agenda. We need to trust his love as our father, but also we need to submit to him as the master potter. What are we talking about? There was a man um, named Jeremiah. In fact, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Paul, all different men in the Bible, all gifted and endowed with the ability to teach people about God's word. They all saw God as a potter. Isaiah says, yet you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Jeremiah says, you know, I went down to the potter's house and watched him, saw him working at the wheel. But the vessel that he was shaping from the clay became flawed in his hand. So what did he do? He formed it into another vessel as it seemed best for him to do. Now, clay in those days wasn't as perfect and pristine as it is today. Maybe in taking a piece of clay, the potter worked on it and formed it. And maybe then near the end noticed, oh no, there's a piece of gravel. There's a small pebble. There's a small imperfection. I'm going to have to take that out. But man, when he takes it out, what's going to happen? It's going to be ruined. So the potter had to smash it all together again and reform it. And yes, sometimes it takes a little prodding, a little poking, a little pinching. And if the clay had emotions, it would say, why are you provoking me? Why are you causing me such pain? But the heart of the potter is to create beauty and form and function to that piece of clay. As a piece of clay, it is near worthless, but in the hands of the master artisan, it can be a work of unprecedented beauty and artistry and perform a wonderful needed function in the house. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Trust God. Let him be your father. Let him be your friend. But let him be your former, get it? Former, the person that will give you form. He may very well be using this pain to shape you and to shape me into something more beautiful than we ever imagined. Now, let me share with you a couple of painful um, examples in my life. One was before the stroke. Before the stroke, I had the opportunity to sit down in a room with some very, very successful men. You know, some of these guys were pastors or leaders of thousands. You know, I mean, thousands of people would come under the influence of their ministry every week. In fact, the head guy, I think there was about 30 30 to 40,000 people here in the greater Sacramento area who came under his influence and ministry every single week. These guys won awards. These guys made albums. These guys wrote, wrote books. These guys hobnobbed with Hollywood celebrities. And then there was me. <laughs> I was nowhere near their league, okay? Just to give you an idea, you know, uh, I've done many jobs, I've worn many hats, and some better than others. You know, one of the most humble ones I did was I worked part-time for a little tiny church who had a youth group. Sometimes it was four kids, man, four kids. And the room in which we met was so dilapidated that I'm not kidding you. I kid you not. This is for real, for real. In the rainy season, 
the carpet would get so wet it grew mushrooms. Yeah, so rainy, so wet, so moldy, so nasty that we grew mushrooms unintentionally, of course, on the carpet. And that was me. <laughs> I think the biggest crowd I had ever performed in front of maybe seven, eight hundred. And that was not usual, you know. Um, and there was these guys. And I felt so lame, I tell you. And I felt looked over. And I felt jealous. And I felt envious. And I felt, you know, God, why? what is so wrong with me? Why do you dislike me so much that you like these guys so much more? I looked at him and I said, well, you know, most of them aren't very good looking guys. <laughs> you know, why would you want to use them? And I struggled with it. But imagine after the stroke, after the stroke, how I must have felt. I tell you, I was literally half a man. I couldn't walk. I couldn't go to the bathroom by myself. I couldn't take a shower by myself. I was dependent on my wife for everything. And you know, I had to do some massive rearranging. I had no choice. Before, as a worship pastor in San Francisco, you know, I measured by the hundreds. And now, I measured by one, two, by my children. But God was there. God was there. And he gave me beauty, even in my ashes. One example. Remember, I told you, I used to be a worship pastor. I was a worship pastor for a number of years in a Bay Area church. And we measured uh, our success by by the hundreds of people that showed up in our services. And that was radically changed. I couldn't sing. I sounded like a, a like a pig. I, I couldn't preach yet. I, I, I couldn't play the piano. I still can't. And I was helping my wife. I was my wife's little teacher's aide. And we were doing my son's, our son's class. Our son's class was a pre-K class of four and five-year-olds. And, and, and there were maybe six kids, eight kids, ten kids on a good Sunday. But I tell you, oh, you know, when those little boys and sometimes little girls uh, would sing, what a mighty God we serve. Oh, it was the most awesome thing. I was moved to tears that God allowed me such a privilege to hear their unadulterated, pure little voices just singing with all the joy in their hearts, their triumph, their victory. What a mighty God we serve. And that was more beautiful than any award or best-selling book, or anything could be. I had to change my measuring state, my definition of success, and I found joy even in my suffering. Another quick example, I, well, I'll try to be quick. Before a stroke, maybe you measure your success by, oh, I ran them half a marathon, or I ran a marathon, or I drove a race car, or I took a long walk up a mountain, you know, I climbed up a mountain. You know, you think about things like that. And many of my greatest joys, even though I, I wasn't in great shape, you know, take a long walk on a beach, or, or go for a, a, a hike, or, you know, do something like that. You know, that was all gone. I was paralyzed. Over half, half my body, it was gone. And I came home in a wheelchair. You guys have heard that before. Uh, one of the ways I did 
quote unquote therapy was I had no tens of thousand dollar treadmill. I had nothing like that. So we would go to a semi abandoned mall. Okay. There was a mall that had its heyday, a shopping mall that had its heyday years ago. And so no one went there. And it was great because there was a play area for the kids, you know, where they have those little rides, you know, you put in 50 cents, you put in 25 cents and, you know, you think it goes back and forth and back and forth, you know, and, and our kids were, you know, they were little, so they're happy with that. And that could keep them occupied. And my wife would load up everybody in a car, buckle everybody down take my heavy wheelchair, throw it in the trunk, and we would travel across town, go to this really sad, depressing little mall. <laughs> and she would pull the wheelchair out and push me, push me to the mall. She would push me across the parking lot and through the doors, and we'd be there. And you know what my therapy was? My therapy wasn't hiking up a mountain. My therapy wasn't taking a pleasant long walk on the beach. My, my therapy was trying to just get out of that wheelchair. Get out of that wheelchair and get what was called a hemi walker. A hemi walker is, is like the walker where elderly use, but it's especially designed and adapted where you can use it with only one hand because that's all I had. I would stretch out, put it maybe a, a foot or two ahead of me, and then shuffle my feet behind it. Put it another 18 inches ahead of me, and then shuffle my feet behind it. I try not to get my feet tangled. I try not to fall down. I try to ignore the pain and ignore the discomfort, ignore the feelings of helplessness. I try to ignore any looks that strangers would give me. And while my kids were playing, I would try to walk. Can I walk 10 feet? Can I walk 12 feet? Could I make it? Could I make it to the, to the center area of the mall, to the food court, and turn around and come back to the wheelchair? And that's all we did. And I had and it was hard, I, I tell you. I had to reprogram my mind to redefine my definition of success. If I could walk just a little farther than I did the day before. If I could make it the whole way without my wife. Eventually, if I could walk around the block, hobbling with my cane. If I could make it one more trip up and down the stairs. Dude, maybe you find yourself in a dark time. Maybe you find yourself, sister, in a difficult, lonely period. Maybe you wonder, why has God abandoned me? Why has God allowed this pain in my life? How can I possibly move on past this terrible and traumatic and life-altering loss? What can I do with the broken pieces of my life? Trust God. Take a step back. Redefine success. I'm not saying lower your standards. No. These goals, these aspirations may be greater, may cost you more, may be more difficult than anything you've ever tried before. But maybe now God wants to do his greatest work in you, in the dark, away from people, away from applause. 
and God might have brought you into this dark and quiet place to work on the innermost parts of your being. Allow him to lovingly and tenderly put you back together and through his spiritual alchemy, turn your scars into gold. Don't hide your brokenness. Let Christ shine through the broken, shattered pieces of your life and your recovery. Redefine your success and let God put you back together. Maybe now's the time that God is calling you to put control into his hands. Give him full control in faith. Adjust and align yourself to his agenda and let him create the new life, the new hope, and the new beauty that you can't possibly imagine. King Solomon, one of the richest and wisest men who ever lived, said this. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Trust God's timing. It seldom is our timing. Maybe you feel that this is the worst possible timing ever conceived for your particular situation and calamity. But trust him that he will make everything beautiful when it's the right time, including your life. Trust him. Let him be the potter today. God bless you.